NWSL 2023 draft. The draft's kicking off Thursday, January 12th. It's right around the corner. It's going to be taking place in Philly, right at the Philadelphia Convention Center as part of the United Soccer Coaches Convention. Listen, we've already had a bit of madness. Shake things up for the official draft order ahead of the NWSL draft. Makes me a little nervous. It makes me wonder like, if we're going to have any other surprises or quick changes uh, I think for the we draft. Will. We, we always do, right? I, I think, think we, we will. Listen, listen, having covered a few of these already in person and in virtual capacities, there's always something that happens that, uh, that shakes things up. But uh, we did an episode about the massive four-team trade, talked about how the draft picks were in part of that trade. So now the draft order looks a little bit different. Shout out to Angel City. They are now the official holders of the number one pick overall in the 2023 draft that was acquired from Gotham FC via that four-team deal. New Jersey, New York, Gotham FC are now making their selection at number two that pick came from orlando as part of that multi-team trade orlando pride still sitting at number three racing louisville at number four portland thorns acquired the number five slot from angel city in a trade and number six belongs to north carolina courage and number seven chicago red stars houston dash will select at number eight North Carolina Courage at number nine and Kansas City Current at number 10. North Carolina Courage once more at 11 and Portland Thorns will be closing out this first round at number 12. So Lisa, does this change things for you in terms of like what we were talking about in our previous draft board episode? We talked about one of the things we talked about specifically was Orlando having two picks in this first round. Yeah. That's... And then we got this multi-team trade deal. We talked about like, Hey, anything could happen, but do we want to see Orlando keep those picks? And you said, Hey, like, I'd like to see them I do. keep both of them and maybe make back-to-back picks here. But uh, now things have shaken up a little bit. Uh, what do you think of this order here? So I did initially say I wanted Orlando to keep their double picks at two and three, uh, just because of, what Orlando needs, right? Where they need to really shore up their roster. However, after the four team trade went down between Portland, Angel City, Gotham, and Orlando, Orlando benefited so much from that trade by gaining so much money. And because of that, they end up losing or or trading away their number two pick to Gotham, which still leaves them the number three pick. So I'm okay with it. I am okay with it. I know I wanted them to have both, but I think Orlando getting the money is is probably a really good even trade off for um, still keeping that top three spot. Right, they're still number three in the draft. And when you look at the draft class that is being laid out for us in 2023, there's a lot of top talent. And despite who number who goes number one and number two in the draft. Uh, Orlando Pride can pick up pretty much anyone across any line and they will be useful for this team. So I think it's okay that Orlando stuck with number three. Um, I think that the power move from Angel City to get that number one spot, like clearly that's what they wanted. With all the trades that happened between Yasmin Ryan coming to Angel City and then going to Gotham and then making all these trades, Angel City wanted the number one pick and they did it. They made it happen with three different teams, um, fantastic for them and i think that having angel city be number one it puts them in a really great position to control their destiny for this draft and control maybe the future of their destiny because this is a team that uh, of course every team wants to do well every team wants to get back to the playoffs but i think the expectation around a club like angel city was to get to the playoffs in the first year was to be this powerhouse and they didn't they fell flat of that so maybe the pressure's on a little bit it was like okay we've got to get number one And they did it. So with Angel City, Gotham, Orlando racing in Portland as the first five, um, I think that's pretty interesting, especially with Portland being number five. That's like a massive trade up for Portland because as a team that wins the NWSL championship, uh, you usually don't see them that high. So I think that's a pick and a team that I'm interested to see who they get. Oh, I'm with you 100. Let's let's maybe run. Let's let's, let's yeah. keep running through this this draft order in this first round because when we're talking about 
we want to do a mock draft here on attacking third. We're going to do these first 12 picks. And I'm so excited to do this alongside you, Lisa, because one of my favorite things that we do here at A3 is make our predictions or make our picks. And I love doing that because I love coming back on these episodes and talking about how incorrect we were. So let's see where we think the draft is going to take us at number one is Angel City. And listen, there's already been a lot of news around this pick. There was a multi-team trade that took place to make sure Angel City was landed in this number one spot. And alongside of that trade reporting, there was the news that Alyssa Thompson was a target for this franchise. And this was before the official January 9th deadline was completed and before Alyssa Thompson had even uh, declared for uh, draft registration. But now, as we're about two days away from this draft, Alyssa Thompson is officially registered for the NWSL draft and all signs point to selecting her at number one here. Completely. I mean, when all the rumors swirled from um, the LA Times saying that Angel City wanted number one just so they could get Alyssa Thompson, it was almost like a caveat. There was an asterisk because Alyssa Thompson had yet to register at that point. Of course, by that evening, this was last Friday, I believe all this happened. Um or, or last Thursday, excuse me, by that evening, Alyssa Thompson had registered for the draft. Her name was submitted. So she's she's going to go number one overall to Angel City. Uh, she's a forward, 18 years old. Um, she committed to Stanford at 15 years old, but has since rescinded that, now entering the draft and making her debut in the NWSL as an 18-year-old. She also has a couple caps under the senior national team. Um, this is a name that you're going to get to know very quickly if you don't already. Uh, but for sure, Alyssa Thompson going number one to Angel City. And I think it's a good pickup for them, right? Like to add a little bit of depth into their front line. We saw a lot of injuries last year that Angel City suffered, whether it was Kristen Press and her ACL or Sydney LaRue after being traded from Orlando. Uh, this is a team that that needs depth in that position and for a player that could potentially be out a lot due to international windows um, I think getting her in and experienced especially in LA is going to be huge for Thompson yeah I'm with you I think I was I was going to ask you that I was going to say like positionally you know mm -hmm. for for this Angel City team is this, is this a selection that makes sense for you and it sounds like you agree with it that you're you're, you're do. down with this all right. I, I do. I think it does make a little bit more sense just because we saw Freya Coombe not rotate a lot last year, right? Uh, especially in her midfield. So to get a midfielder for Angel City, I think would be beneficial for them, but I don't think they would get a lot of playing time. And I think a condition perhaps for Alyssa Thompson to, to join the league was like, hey, I want to play, right? Like. <laughs> You want to play. You want to play. Yeah. So uh, you don't want to be one of those. You don't want to be a number one draft pick that sits on the bench and gets 15 minutes at the end of the game. Yeah. I, I Listen, I, I don't think you – I don't think you're Angel City and you make the move to land this pick. Because let's, let's go back to this trade a little bit and walk through some of the steps. They traded – Angel City traded with Portland first there was Yasmin Ryan was the player involved and money was involved and then there yeah. was a trade with Angel City and even more allocation money was involved along with Yasmin Ryan so you're telling me that you're spending nearly nearly half a million dollars for a number one pick in Alyssa Thompson we're talking 450,000 ish dollars here right to make this selection and to not play this player listen i know i think we're gonna see i think we're gonna see Alyssa thompson in i hope we do <laughs> and i hope that we do and listen i, I think it I, I think if you have this player um available declared for the draft at number one you absolutely take Thompson and yes is she going to need yeah. time to adapt to the professional level uh, especially a league like NWSL where it's very fast right very transitional very fast pace, can be very physical at times I think more than ever you want to get this young player acclimated as, as quickly also, as you can I don't so think she's going to need that much it. 
I don't think she's going to need that much adjustment. She's been playing with boys teams two years older than her. She's already had caps internationally against England, against Spain. I, I think her transition is, is going to be pretty smooth. I think the biggest tra- transition for her is going to be playing under a Freya Coombe system and, and yeah. playing along certain players where she's maybe not the superstar anymore um, and, and has to fit a role a little bit more versus having the freedom to do whatever she wants. I'm with you. Number two, New Jersey, New York, Gotham FC, number two overall selection would anticipate that they are going to go with what is they perceive as the best available player at this position. But we believe that they're going to go with Michelle Cooper, the forward out of Duke University at number two, 21 years old, finished her sophomore season at Duke, was the Matt Herman Trophy winner. And made some folks nervous. We didn't see Michelle Cooper on this registration list uh, immediately, but she's there now, and we would anticipate that Gotham makes that selection at number two. Yeah, I think that Gotham, it it would really behoove them to go with a player like this. Uh, Gotham needs to score goals, right? I mean, they had a lot of problems in 2022, um, but I think that it's a really easy answer to say, hey, you got to score goals. And I think that Gotham could sure up across any line of their roster. So they're going to go with the highest pick, and that's going to be Michelle Cooper at this point. I mean, she ended uh, her season in November with Duke and then decided she was no longer returning, which just made a lot of eyeballs bright and, and, and widen to see where this player was going to go. Um, they Duke ended up losing in the quarterfinal to Alabama, in which Michelle Cooper had a brace in that loss to Bama. Uh, the U-20 U.S. captain, she was the golden boot winner and the golden ball winner in the CONCACAF qualifying tournament. She scored eight goals, so she can do it at the international level. Now seeing how she fits into Gotham and their system, but she's she's going to go high, and I think she's going to go number two over Gotham. I'm with you. Let's go to number three. Orlando Pride have their original selection at number three. And we at A3 believe that they're going to go with Izzy Diakia out of Santa Clara, the forward who racked up 50 goals and 14 assists in, over the course of her collegiate career. But listen, when you have those top three picks in in the draft, I think a lot of the energy on these mock boards is, hey, you want to take that best available mm-hmm. talent across the board. And I think you and I maybe want to make a case for a midfielder for Orlando Pride that maybe that is the position that they should be targeting. But even though that's the position that they might have to target, that that's perhaps the team need, we just feel like if Izzy Diakia is on this board, that they're going to go with her at number three. I do. I mean, even when you look at someone like Izzy Diakia, this is a player that is traditionally played forward with Santa Clara in the draft. I think she also registered as a midfield midfielder. So she has a lot of freedom. She has a lot of versatility, which is why we kept her at number three for Orlando pride. Even though we both think that Orlando could, could use more of a midfield player. Um, I also think that someone like uh, Clara Roberts midfielder out of Florida state would be a really good pick for Orlando but I just don't foresee uh, someone like Clara Robbins going this high. And when you have someone like Diakia on the board, you're going to pick her at this point. And with Orlando Pride losing their number two spot, this is their pick in the first round draft. You have to go high at this point. It's not like they've got another pick at 9-10 in this first round. They don't. So with Orlando Pride, I think they have to stick with Uh, the forward out of Santa Clara. Uh, She can drop deeper into the midfield. I mean, she's going to add to your game with everything that she can do. She's been a national champion. She's been in the College Cup two times with Santa Clara during her career. Um, All-American first team, WCC Offensive Player of the Year in her senior year. A lot of accolades for this player, and she's going to add to Orlando's team. Yeah, I'm with you 100%. I think when you're looking at players, uh, best players available, this is one of those players. And I would anticipate the Akia stays at, at number three if she's still on the board here. I, I, I think it's important that you noted that she did also sort of have the, the forward and midfielder registration attached to her yeah. uh, going into this draft. but And making the case for somebody like a Clara Robbins, I think who's more just like that pure midfielder, which is why we think at number four, for racing Louisville FC, we think that Clara Robbins might go to Louisville or stay 
with Louisville question mark <laughs> the midfielder out of Florida State University for folks who are unaware Clara Robbins has spent some time in the USLW league with racing uh, Louisville side uh, made some uh, a pretty impressive appearances uh, 10 matches racked up uh, four goals and assists uh, Really, really good showing, I think, <laughs> during a brief yeah. time uh, with this side, uh, whether it was, uh, you know, going up against uh, the Indy 11 or King's Hammer FC, uh, all those other great clubs in, in, in USLW League. So someone who has uh, coming out of a fantastic program in Florida State University, but also had this has this added layer to her with a handful of games with the USLW League. So I think when we're lo also looking at, yes, at this point in the first in the first round, who are those best players available to make at these very early selections? But perhaps if you're a certain team with very, very heavy needs like Louisville, they need players who could probably come in and slot in immediately. You're also looking for players who are quote unquote NWSL ready, right? Maybe players who yeah. aren't going to need that much time to get acclimated. And I think if you're looking at a certain position on the pitch, if you're looking at that middle third, I think Clara Robbins is the most midfield ready uh, player to go uh, in this first round. I agree. She is totally midfield ready. I think that's a, a really good way to put it. And when you look at at Racing Louisville and kind of the roster that they've built up, they have a a, a midfield that is very young. You look at uh, Jalen Shaw, uh, Jalen Howe, excuse me, Savannah DeMello, um, uh, Lauren Malay, who sometimes slots into that midfield. This is a uh, Lauren Malay being one of the most veteran ones with just a few years in the league under her belt. So adding in someone else like Clara Roberts could seem a bit dangerous for Kim Bjorkegren and racing Louisville. But I think that bringing someone, um, from Virginia into this team, Florida State University. She has experience playing at Louisville. I think that's what gives her a really big upper hand. Uh, she's won a national championship in 2018 when she was young on this FSU team. Um, and, and when she finished in 2020 U, uh, 2022 at FSU, she finished with 110 games played. That was the most in Florida State history and the second most in women's college soccer history. So she's played a crap ton of games. And I think that yeah. that experience will really lend to what she can bring to racing Louisville. I'll be interested to see, though, how she fits into to what they're doing in the midfield. And I could see her even she's a midfielder, but she has also played defense later in her career or in other stages. So to see her dropped into the back line, perhaps for Kim Bjorkegren, I think that could be a benefit, too. Uh, we'll see if Bjorkgren, uh has that vision uh, in this selection. I think this is an area of the draft though where maybe we could get the potential for mm -hmm. another shakeup. Maybe this middle portion of the table is where we start to see some trades again. I feel like Portland Thorns already made the, the, the move to try to get in higher into this draft, and maybe they humor uh, Racing Louisville to, to negotiate another trade because we are looking at a player – in this middle selection at number five in Emily Madrill, the defender out of Florida State US, uh, Florida State University, but has played overseas uh, in Sweden. Again, when we're talking about players who are potentially NWS already, we're talking about Claire Robinson, of course. We're also including Emily Madrill within that same conversation as well. Do we see a swap? Does Racing Louisville say, hey, We've got some midfielders who are locked up here, but we really have our eye on Clara Robbins. And we're thinking that we're going to take her at number four. Maybe we get into a trade here with uh, with Portland Thorns, who yep. perhaps also need to make a selection for a defender. So there are. it's interesting that in number four and in number five, there's a similar team need here for going I with agree. a defender. And what's it going to look like within these two positions? But if things shake out, there's the potential for somebody like Emily Madrill to go number five to Portland Thorns, who, look, they've got Becky Sauerbrunn. They've yeah. got Emily Menges. I think it's pretty evident that Kelly Hugley got next. I mean, she is the player that you want to make sure you continue to build within that back line at the center back position. Who else are you bringing in to ensure that you have depth at this role? I think uh, you're looking at somebody like Emily Madrill. 
I agree completely. I, I think it's interesting you talk about the shakeup. I mean, this was um, Emily Madrill is a player that I think if before we had the draft list and before we knew what was really happening with Michelle Cooper saying that she's going to join Alyssa Thompson, saying that she's going to enter the draft, Emily Madrill is a player that I think would have gone higher perhaps than five if it wasn't for some of these superstar forwards coming in 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 Thompson and Cooper and Izzy Diakia. Um but Emily Madrill, a, a tremendous player, a tremendous, tremendous defender, uh, formerly with Florida State, and who has the professional experience because she's uh, been playing overseas in Sweden. And I think that that gives a huge upper hand to a team like Portland Thorns. Um, I, I'm honestly like a little shocked that we have Madrill so low, right, at five. I'm putting quotes around that. But it's more yeah. on team's need at this point. And although she is, is one of the – top defenders in this entire draft and, and we saw a defender go number one last year uh the year before in emily fox last year in naomi gurma um i don't think it's unusual to see a defender go this high but based on team's needs the forwards are going to go first and that leaves emily madrill to this five spot and i think her going to portland thorns would be incredible for her career imagine the development of a player like emily madrill learning underneath someone like a Becky Sauerbrunn, a Kelly Hubley who's gone through the fight of it, um, it, playing in front of a Belle Bigsby, right? Playing with and against someone in training like Sophia Smith. I think the development for Madrill is going to be most beneficial at Portland. Look, I think uh, going with Madrill, I think anywhere between one to five will probably uh, be a potential landing spot for for this player. This is a player that I think has been on multiple teams' radars for probably over the last two years, honestly. Um, but we'll see where she ends up landing. I mean, shout out to to San Diego Wave, right? They they went the defender route. They chose defender yeah. number one overall in, in Naomi Girma. So we'll see if uh, if that's a similar energy in this year's draft. Number six, North Carolina Courage. We're going the forward route for them. No Dabinia. They got to make sure that they continue to have a dynamic attack. We think that they might choose a forward at this uh, at this slot. We're going with uh, Alexa Spancher out of Virginia. For North Carolina Courage, they've got another pick in this draft. So we'll talk about perhaps both of these moves later uh, at number 10. Let's uh, also talk about number seven's selection with Chicago Red Stars. Lisa, when we were talking about certain team needs out of this draft, Chicago was one of, a, of about four clubs that we were talking about that just need bodies uh, mm -hmm. on their roster we're looking at chicago we're looking at the spirit right we're, we're looking at racing louisville look who are these uh you know franchises looking at in this draft to try to flesh out some of their rosters and while chicago has a deep deep need for midfielders at this moment they might have shown their hat a little bit ahead of this draft by announcing a signing of a midfielder and addy mccain so who do yeah. you think they might take at number seven we think here at A3 that they actually might go with a forward, and we think they might go with Penelope Hawking out of Penn State. And perhaps maybe we can make a case here at this selection in number seven for other positions for the Red Stars as well. Will they stay with, with the forward? Do they want a versatile forward? Is somebody like Riley Mattingly Parker out of Alabama available at this point? Is there another Alabama player and somebody like Raina Ray yeah. is available at this point, a defender in this selection? Do you think Chicago can go wrong choosing any of these players at this point? No, I, honestly, I can. And that's why I'm, doing these mock drafts is, is tricky when we get to six, seven, eight, nine, because these teams, it, it first of all, it depends who's left, right? At this point, if Izzy Diakia is still available, I think Chicago is going to pick her up, right? If Emily Madrill is still available, I think that we could see North Carolina, Chicago, Houston pick up a player like that. So it, it becomes tricky and more down to the specific tendencies of a player and the specific needs of a team. And, and someone like Hawking um, out of Penn State, she a fifth year at Penn State. Um, she played at West Virginia previously, or excuse me, she played at Virginia previously or USC and, and and this is a player that can score goals and I think when you couple that alongside someone like Mallory Pugh it could be really beneficial for a team like Chicago to get that especially heading into a World Cup year where you need players to step up and to score goals and we talked about how Chicago is an incredibly young team they were last year and, and now that those so many young players last year will be in their second year 
I think that they will have so much to teach someone like a Hawking coming into this team. So I, I agree with Hawking, Penelope Hawking going here. And I also agree with Alexa Spanstra out of Virginia going to North Carolina at number six. I think that uh, Spanstra is a player, um, a forward that can can help this team out in in, in North Carolina because losing Dabinia, uh, they've got to score some goals. And and someone like Spanstra can create. She can score goals. Uh, so I think Spanstra at six and then Penelope Hawking at seven for Chicago. Let's take a look at number eight for Houston Dash and who they could possibly select here at this uh, position. We're actually going to go with Messiah Bright, the forward out of TCU. Listen, where fans of this player thought she had a great career with TCU. And when we're looking at Houston, this is another team that has made some announcements of not maybe so much big free agency signings, but they did kick off their offseason bringing back Sophie Schmidt, bringing back Alyssa Chapman, and they recently made announcements that they off they they have a new contract with uh, Prysock, uh, and they also announced that they uh, re-signed uh, midfielder Emily Ogle. So there's there's some things that they have done here leading up to the draft that I'm curious about how they're going to navigate at this position. I'm also very curious how they're going to navigate uh, the loss of somebody like a Nichelle Prince, someone who's currently yeah. uh, navigating an injury that is a huge piece of their attack. And I think a good way they could try to help navigate that is by drafting Messiah Bright. Completely agree. Masai Bright is one of the best number nines, one of the best strikers um, it, coming out of this draft. Out of TCU, 49 career goals throughout her college career. She became TCU's all-time leader, leader in career points in 2021, took the team to five straight NCAA tournaments. Uh, she elevated TCU. And I think when you look at a team like Houston Dash, um, this is a team that made their first NWSL playoffs in 2022. They're looking to repeat. They're looking to grow. And, and to find a striker that is going to be a through and through striker, it allows for someone like Shea Groom to have a little bit more freedom on the pitch to push up higher out of the midfield because you know you're going to have Messiah Bright stretching really high. I mean, playing alongside someone like Maria Sanchez, Ebony Salmon, like imagine that partnership uh, adding into the mix someone like Bright. I, I think that at number eight, um, this is a really good pick for Bright. And it's also one of the best picks at this point, right? You go highest for a team like Houston Dash and, and kind of what's left on the board. And Messiah Bright is, is no scrap to be left on the board. And Houston's going to gobble her up as soon as they can. Let's uh, chat a little bit more about North Carolina Courage at number nine. Who could they take at number nine? They acquired this selection from San Diego a via a trade last year. And if this player is available still, we believe that they are going to make the selection for Tori Hansen, the defender out of UNC. I agree. I think um, uh, this player for UNC is has that homegrown feel that can provide for North Carolina. Uh, Sean Nahas, he has been a profound coach throughout the North Carolina system and the entire state and understanding Anson Dorrance, Dorrance and what he's been able to do at UNC, a player like Tori Hansen as a defender. Um, she's also local. She's from Raleigh. I think that this would be a really good grab for North Carolina, maybe a little bit higher than other people thought for this defender. Uh, but I think you have to stick with with what you know, and North Carolina can definitely shore up their back line, right? They've already gotten a pick a little bit earlier. We went with um, Alexa Spanstra, the forward. So now they go with the defender, really tighten in both ends uh, of their, their lineup. Number 10, Kansas City Current on the board. Look, we opened up this entire episode talking a whole ton about Kansas City Current and the fact that they landed to Binia in the free agency sweepstakes. So what are their team needs? Who could they even target here? Uh, they've got a ton of midfielders uh, in, in the mix heading into 2022. They've got a pretty good attacking line, especially now that they've added somebody like Dabinia. So who could be the best player available here at this election if they're looking to perhaps add some depth 
to their roster. I'm curious if, if Kansas City Current even stays in this number 10 selection yeah. with all of the recent moves that they made. But in the event that they stay here, we're going to go with Reyna Reyes, the defender slash midfielder out of Alabama, uh, going at number 10 to Kansas City Current in uh, in the hopes that they're looking to, to perhaps add some depth for, for their back line. Andrew, I think it's so important that you said if Kansas City stays at number 10, because we're doing this uh, mock draft on Tuesday, so two days before the draft actually happens on Thursday, and I could foresee Kansas City um, making a trade for a later pick, giving this to another team, perhaps that wants to be a little bit higher. I'm looking at someone like Washington Spirit that could could make a move to get into the first round that would behoove a team like Washington spirit. But if Kansas city stays in this position, uh, they're going to go after Rena Reyes um, out of Alabama. This is an incredible, incredible player. Mac Herman trophy semifinalist. She was the sec defender of the year, but she can also score goals. And I think when you look at Kansas city roster and what they're made up of, it's a lot of talented players that have specific pit, positions that they prefer or maybe that they've been played in most traditionally, but they also float around a lot. I'm specifically looking at someone like an Alex Luera, who was a rookie for Kansas City last year. She played defender all throughout college and she got to Kansas City. She talked with Matt Potter and she was like, hey, listen, I want to score goals. I want to get higher. Put me up the field, see what happens. And by the end of it, she's starting in the midfield for the NWSL championship. Rena Reyes is a very similar player to Alex Luera and that defensively, she locked down defender of the year um, she can keep shutouts like the best of them but also if you push her higher on set pieces stretch her into the attacking end of the field she's gonna find a way to get on the end of it it's that ruthless type of player that's got just a, a nose and a high IQ of understanding of the game of soccer and it's someone that would fit really well into Matt Potter's system yeah 100% agreement. We've got two more selections to make. Let's go with number 11, North Carolina Courage. This acquired from a trade, Kansas City, that took place last year. So North Carolina sitting at number 11. Look, they've got similar to 2022 when they had multiple picks in this first round. North Carolina has found themselves in a similar position in 2023's draft so curious about who they're going to make uh, at this selection this late in the first round who are those players at this point are the are the best players that you consider available on the board those players that you think might go in the first round but had the potential to drop in the second round and we are going to go with another forward for North Carolina and Riley Manningly Parker out of Alabama in this slot as well. I think we have to take a look at this point in terms of the picks that we've given to North Carolina thus far in this first round. So we went forward at number six with Alexis Spantra. We went defender with Hanson at number nine. And now at 11, we're going with another forward in Riley Mattingly Parker out of Alabama. Some versatility, I think, too, with this player. I think she could play mm -hmm. across the line if they really want to take the gamble uh, and try to you know, push some development there. I think coming off of the season that North Carolina had when you had this, uh, this sort of breakout season by Diana Ordonez, when you sort of had this big uh, international player kind of come in and sort of announce her arrival in Caroline, who is going to slot in along these players and who can sort of continue to sort of keep that kind of high octane sort of attack going. We know that Dabinia was a big, big part of that for this team. And it's going to be tough to try to replace a player of that caliber. And alongside that, you've got two players who are not going to go into a sophomore season with yeah. North Carolina courage. So how's that going to look like, uh, or what is that going to, to look like moving forward? So I think uh, don't be surprised if North Carolina maybe wants to choose or uh, add on some, some extra attackers into the mix for their team moving forward. Uh, yeah. And I, I even think with uh, Riley Matling or Parker, being at 11, it's it's a little low for a player of this caliber because I uh, went to the College Cup with Alabama, Mac Herman Trophy semifinalist. She was an All-American, SEC forward of the year. Uh, she's a scholar. I think that she'll fit in really well at North Carolina because – 
as you mentioned, she can play across the front line. You could even drop her a little bit deeper if you needed to. She's got uh, a lot of versatility in her skill and what she's able to do. She's a head down um, and fight for it. Like this was, I, I think I could also like between Kansas City going with Rena Reyes and then North Carolina with Matling Parker, I, I could see that flip almost a little bit, but I, I like to keep Reyna Reyes as a defender with Kansas City current, but I'm really excited to see how high this player goes, but I think North Carolina would be a really good pick for for Parker as a forward heading into this league. I mean, they lost to Vina. They've got to sure up. They've got to have a little bit of depth. You're going to lose Caroline at the World Cup. You're going to lose some of these other players during World Cup time and, and international play. Let's close out this first round and our mock draft at number 12. Portland Thorns have the final selection of the first round. And listen, we chatted about the middle area of this draft order. We think there might be some movement uh, come draft day. So I'm a little curious as if we're correct in, in predicting that maybe there could be some movement in those middle selections. And what would that mean for this final selection for the Thorns? in this category and in the event that they still need a defender we're going to stick with it we're going to go with Jalissa Harris the defender a center back out of South Carolina listen I'm just going to echo my sentiments from that earlier selection in the events that uh, this is the position that they want to target um, got to have depth along that back line you're going to miss somebody like a Becky Sauerbrunn who was likely going to a World Cup at this point. I don't think that that is a, would be a shocker if folks saw the 37-year-old captain going to the World Cup. Uh, and then you're going to you know, have a, a large window of time there uh, to where maybe you're going to need some, some depth to slot in to those positions. And we're coming off of a season for, for Portland where we saw somebody like an Emily Mengus have to navigate various injury, right? A player who's also in a different um, stage and phase of her career. So they're definitely going to have to start looking at some areas to provide depth in that position specifically. And I think uh, Harris is a, is a good option at this point on the board at the final selection in the first round. Yeah, I, I agree. I think Portland Thorns taking a player like Jalissa Harris out of South Carolina is going to be a huge move. And and you talked about how versatile Harris is because she can play across the back line. Center back is her, her main role, but she can also play higher up the pitch. And I think with Portland, we could see her being floated around a little bit to fill a hole where it's needed, whereas uh, traditionally her role will be in the center back. Uh, will she get there initially? I'm not sure. Maybe they'll starter on the outside or starter a little higher up the field but Harris is a four-time conference all-American she she brings a lot of depth she brings a lot of talent to this Portland side and if Portland stays at this number 12 pick they should go with Harris so Portland's got a number five pick in, in which they're gonna take Emily Madrill another defender formerly with FSU that went to play professionally and now they're going with Jalissa Harris a, a defender a center back out of South Carolina at, to close out the first round and that's if Portland stays here. I, I, I mean, we talked about it a little bit, Sandra. I could foresee Portland making a trade, Kansas City making a trade out of that number 10 spot. Maybe we'll see a team like Washington Spirit somehow wiggle their way into this first round to get one of these top 12 draft prospects. There's definitely a lot of moving parts to come, but uh, this, is, this is a pretty good round out about where everything is for now. I'm excited about it. That's it for our mock draft. We just wanted to do the first uh, round for everyone. And, and Lisa and I are going to be in Philly for the 2023 NWSL draft. So we're going to see firsthand uh, how how hit or miss we were uh, in this mock draft order. I'm excited for, for, for chaos. I think we're always excited to see some, some movement around this day. And it's an exciting um, event in general. And it's very, very cool that the NWSL draft is returning to a live and in-person event for the first time since 2020. We can't wait to participate in it.